welcome back. It is Monday. I am Mr. Sisatris, and this week I wanted to talk to you about science fiction. And yes, my Christmas tree's up already. I don't care. It's I love it. So sue me. Moving on. Um, Sci-fi as a genre is kind of vague sometimes, and um, I think it helps to understand kind of the subgenres that make up sci-fi. So here is a rundown of ten of the not all of them, but ten of the kind of biggest subgenres of sci-fi um to kind of help you get more familiar with the with the genre if you haven't read a lot of sci-fi and you don't know where to jump in you don't know what kind of stuff would appeal to you this is going to be a really chaotic rundown of kind of the 10 biggest ones that will probably pique your interest first up on the list we have space opera um this one is sort of the sci-fi equivalent of like high fantasy um, where you've got lots of characters, you've got multiple planets, space stations, ships, different alien races, um, big long character arcs, that kind of stuff. Um, examples of this would be Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. It's more than a trilogy. This is just the first three, but there's a whole bunch more. And also The Expanse. Um, one thing I will say also about sci-fi genres is there's lots of overlap, and so I'm going to, to be talking about other genres going down the road and there might be like, oh, hey, that also fits that genre. So just be aware of that. Um, this one also kind of fits into the hard sci-fi label, kind of, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But yes, um, space opera is the big grand sweeping stuff. It also includes stuff like Star Trek um, as well. Lots of different alien races, planets, people, worlds, that kind of stuff. Oh, and there's a cat. Okay. Look at that. Yeah. Next up on the list is an older genre that you don't see a lot of lately, uh, but it's one that I really, really love, and that is the planetary romance. Now, this can this spans everything from like the super pulpy, ridiculous stuff to more high concept stuff. Um, but the two that you're probably most familiar with is um, Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter trilogy. This was like 1912, so it's pretty, pretty early. Um, and this one follows a human guy who somehow gets sent to Mars and, um, he, you know, battles monsters and saves princesses and all that kind of stuff. The planetary romance is sort of confined to a single planet usually. And it, it's, it's, it has a lot in common with like the old sword and sorcery kind of things like think Conan the Barbarian. Um, it's that kind of stuff where it's confined to a single planet. You usually have like an outsider character who lands on the planet at the beginning, has the adventure on the planet and then leaves at the end. Um, and it has kind of a retro sort of feel. Um, another one that fits into this category is Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. Now this one is a lot less of the, you know, swords and princesses and dinosaurs on Mars and all that kind of stuff, but it does still fit because you got someone land on a planet, they've got this other world, this other culture, they kind of learn about it, they get pulled into the plot, and then, you know, at the end there. So Planetary Romance is a ton of fun. Um, there was kind of a more recent series or book or something by S.M. Sterling. I haven't read it yet, but it's the same kind of thing. You've got like dinosaurs on Venus and and you know jungles and and barbarian princesses and all that kind of stuff and it's a great genre and i really really want it to come back it's so pulpy and cheesy it's great next up on the list number three is um military sci-fi um again this is kind of a it inner it overlaps with a lot of other genres a lot of military sci-fi also kind of is a space opera um, but military sci-fi specifically is when it focuses on sort of characters in a military fighting either alien invasion or other planets um, but the focus is like kind of on that like the military lifestyle and you know weaponry and machinery and technology and all that kind of stuff um one that i've read is john scalzi's old man's war this is part of a series i haven't read the rest of the series but i did read the first one and um this was a ton of fun it's it's kind of goofy and and um i don't know it's just enjoyable popcorn flick um Another one that's a little more serious would be um, Starship Troopers by Heinlein, Robert A. Heinlein. Um, and that one is, you know, also very famous by the movie version, which is very different from the book. But again, you've got, you know, this military group that's going out and they're fighting space bugs and it's great. Next up on the list would be the dystopian stuff. Um, now this is usually a lot less focused on technology 
and other worlds and stuff, but it is kind of looking more at like near future Earth and looking at sort of, you know, civilization is still intact, but it's it's crumbling. Think like, you know, the last years of the Roman Empire kind of thing. Things aren't going well. You've got fascist dictatorships or, you know, corporations own everything. Um, the there's usually like a few wealthy people at the top and then most everyone else is really struggling um and it's just kind of a little nightmarish um so good examples of that one would be octavia butler's parable of the sower um this is where you've got like you know climate change global economic crisis um gated sort of slums where people are kept and um a kind of charismatic demagogue who sort of captures a lot of people's attention who um sounds sort of familiar um but this one is great um also another one is ray bad ray bradbury's fahrenheit 451 again this isn't necessarily about the fall of civilization but it's like a civilization that is actively falling so in this one you've got people have have just been kind of manipulated to think that you know anything that is deep or complicated things like books are banned and sh you know shouldn't be um sh shouldn't be read everyone's just kind of kept in this state of of blissful ignorance by sort of loud advertisements and um really vacuous television programming um and people are kind of kept you know in the dark and not noticing the really thing like the really big stuff that's happening about kind of the fall of civilization so that is another good one. Now, moving on from the dystopian stuff, number four is we've got post-apocalyptic. Um, now, this is usually after the fall of civilization. You've got kind of pockets of humanity struggling to survive. Um, the focus is very much on, like, human nature and and looking at kind of the, the you know, the, the things that make up culture that, that are lost when a civilization falls and what things are able to endure in the people. Um, two good examples of that one. We've got Octavia Butler, Dawn. This is a really cool one. Again, this one kind of blends a little bit with space opera because you've got kind of the earth has been destroyed by a nuclear holocaust. You've got these alien beings who come in and they say, we're going to help you rebuild the earth. And so they take a few people aboard their ship and kind of tell them how they're going to train them, how they're going to fix the planet. And you're never really sure if they should trust these aliens or not, but it's all about you know, rebuilding the earth after an apocalypse and whether or not people should be in charge of it themselves or if they need outside help. Lots of big, huge, high concept questions. Um, another good one is Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, starting with Oryx and Crake. This one, you've got a genetically engineered virus that kind of destroys most of the world. And you've got these genetically engineered beings, or not beings, but like people and, and animals. And you've got the characters kind of wandering through this sort of um, collapsed hellscape and remembering back to kind of what it was right before the fall of civilization and sort of what things were like and the books kind of go on very um, high concept sci-fi again and um, really really gripping next up is a really fun one and this one is hard sci-fi this is where you get sort of a look at the near future or the distant future, but it's kind of designed to be as plausible as possible. So there's not a lot of hand wavy, you know, like sci-fi stuff. Um, you don't have like, oh, and there's a warp core and they can travel faster than light somehow. Um, it's very rooted in kind of the real, um, like the realistic technology of kind of what could be possible kind of extrapolating from where we are now and saying what's the most plausible way things would play out. Um, one that I really love is Mary Robinette Cole's Lady Astronaut series. This is also a um, alternate history where the space race kind of happens sooner than the 60s. It happens in the 50s um, because of a uh, meteor impact on the Earth. And so there's this sort of like Apollo 13 aesthetic um, in the 50s and they have to get off earth somehow and they have to travel space and colonize things but they can only do it with technology that would have been available in the 50s and 60s and it's a great series wonderful characters i really really enjoy it another one is kim stanley robinson's mars trilogy this is one of my favorite sci-fi trilogies of all time ever um and th this basically just it's three books and it shows kind of 
the colonization of Mars and the terraforming of Mars and how would that play out? How would we survive on Mars? What kinds of things would happen? And for the most part, there's a few hand wavy things in terms of like medical discoveries that they make. But for the most part, it's very rooted in kind of realistic technology. And he goes on and on about like, you know, lichen and how lichen will work to terraform Mars. And it's utterly gripping, so good. Next up is cozy sci-fi, and this is one that's kind of recent. It's grown out of some other genres. Um, one that is really popular right now is uh, Becky Chambers' Wayfarer series, um, which starts with The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. And the focus is, again, you've got the kind of space opera vibe, but it's more focused on the low stakes plots. And so it's all about like personal discovery, moving past trauma, um, getting out of a bad situation, um, uncovering a mystery, that kind of thing. But it's not, you know, save the galaxy, save the world kind of thing. It's just people kind of interpersonal dynamics. Another really good one that I love is Mary Robinette Kowal's The Spare Man, which is kind of a, a cozy murder mystery on a space station. And it's got kind of this um, 1960s sci-fi kind of vibe, very retro sci-fi, and it's great. Again, it's just a fun, enjoyable kind of place you just want to kind of live in all the while they're trying to solve this murder mystery on this kind of luxury uh, space station. Next up on the list is science fantasy. Um, this is a kind of a vague genre, and it's hard to tell sometimes where this genre ends and others begins, but for the most part, the main thing is, is that this is where hand-waving is part of the fabric of everything. You can have, you know, ships and aliens and everything, but you can also have magic and, you know, special abilities and all that kind of stuff that goes beyond being just like being psychic. Um, and so a really good example of this one is Dune by Frank Herbert. I know this is also called uh, space opera and it does sort of fit into that genre as well but the whole thing with like spice and being able to kind of manipulate space with your mind um, all that kind of stuff it kind of helps it to to move into sort of more of the science fantasy Thing. Um, the Dune series is great. It gets really weird at times, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and you just have to kind of unhook your brain sometimes because there's certain things in there that you're like, that's not something that's possible, but it's fine because it's Dune and it's great. So whatever. Um, another good example of this one is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. I've also seen this characterized as just fantasy, but it does kind of live in that science fantasy sort of realm and it can kind of jump between genres it's really hard to pin down um this one you've got kind of it's set on a planet that may or name may or may not be earth um and it has these horrible seismic events that happen periodically there's people who can control these uh, seismic events with their minds there's this these rock beings that can move through stone and are made from stone and there's a mystery of that there's these giant glowing obelisk not glowing but these giant floating obelisks that are kind of spaced all over the, the planet and they don't really know what to do with them they don't know how they function and it's just wonderful it's very high concept the first time i read this it kind of broke my brain a little bit and i did struggle through the second book in the series just because it's really complex and and everything but it's worth it to make it to the end the whole series is so rewarding it's just very cool. Next up is a fairly recent uh, genre. I think it's like mid 20th century that it kind of showed up and that's Afrofuturism. And this is a, a pretty big genre and I really hope to see a lot more of it um, because it's such a cool genre. But it's sort of, what it is is it, it's science fiction or speculative fiction that looks at sort of the world through the lens of kind of the African diaspora. And, and it kind of posits how the cultures and people um, will kind of adapt and evolve and how they'll endure in the future and in contact with sort of alien life and everything. And it's just, it's really complex. I can't really put it into into words. 
um, that are a lot more eloquent than, than that. But it's just sort of, it's sci-fi through the lens of kind of um, the African and the black experience, um, the culture and and the people and the, just the vibes are immaculate. Um, a really cool one that I read recently is um, Nnedi Okorafor's uh, a Binti trilogy, which is a series of YA novellas, um, and it's got this kind of this this young girl who um, has kind of grown up in more traditional African society. She leaves Earth to go to this um, university on this other other planet and gets pulled into this sort of conflict between aliens and humans. Um, and just the way that her society is described is great because there's all these sort of traditional um, practices that have obviously endured for thousands and thousands of years, but there's also, they're also really good at like, you know, technology and, you know, you've got hovercrafts and, and it's just wonderful. The technology is very cool and it's very interesting in the way that it's blended with sort of the, the traditional aspects of this person's culture and it's just a lot of fun. Another good example is um, Octavia Butler again, because she's amazing, uh, Kindred. Now this isn't futuristic, but it is sci-fi. You've got this character from the 70s who just for some reason is time traveling back to the 19th century America, and she interacts with her own ancestors um, during the times of slavery, and it's complex, and it's, it's all about sort of rethinking the narrative and, you know, s centering black women in this slave narrative um, and and being more aware of kind of the connections between the past and the present and how you can't just be like, oh, well, that happened a long time ago and it isn't relevant anymore. Um, but this book is wonderful and it's heartbreaking and um, everything, but it's it's really, really fantastic. But Afrofuturism is very cool, and I hope we see a lot more. Nnedi Okorafor has also written a ton of other stuff. I know she has a book, Lagoon, um, that's really well regarded. So check her out um, and explore that genre a whole lot more. Finally, the last one on the list, number 10. This is a genre that I kind of made up, um, but it's one that, I don't know, I think is worth exploring because it's a story you see over and over and over again and it's also kind of the story that you see in one of the earliest science fiction books. Now my term for this is science gone wrong and it basically it tells the story of a scientist usually a male uh, who tries to create life or control life or control evolution somehow and his creations get away from him and they turn against him and it's sort of this cautionary tale um, of some kind or another. Of course, the earliest example of this would be Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, who is kind of one of the earliest sci-fi novels ever. Um, you know, obviously everyone knows the story of this one. You know, guy creates monster, guy doesn't, he, he rejects monster and doesn't give it sort of the, the proper care and attention that one would give someone so he kind of shirks his responsibility and of course the monster turns against him because it feels lost and um it's it's amazing also we've got hg wells the island of dr moreau where you've got a scientist who tries to sort of uh civilize animals he like performs bizarre experiments on animals on this island and turns them into like human animal hybrids and tries to teach them like civilization and and human politeness and everything and of course it falls apart and the animals turn against him and um it's scary this book is great um uh, sylvia moreno garcia also recently did the daughter of dr moreau which sort of takes this and re-extrapolates it um through the mind of kind of his daughter um and it's set um in like around Mexico instead of kind of in the island of the Caribbean kind of thing, but it's great. Uh, another one, everyone knows this one, is Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. You've got guy tries to bring dinosaurs back to life and control them and, and market them as, a, as a, a tourist attraction. And of course the, the natural evolutionary process takes over and the dinosaurs break free and havoc ensues and it's great. Um, and I love it. So that's I don't know if that there's a, a term for that genre. I think these would fall under like sci-fi horror or sci-fi thrillers. Um, but 
there's this story of like even uh, margaret atwood's mad adam trilogy you've got the same kind of thing you've got this guy he creates this genetically engineered virus it escapes and kills everyone um and then he also creates these genetically engineered people and he kind of loses control of them and they kind of create their own culture without his influence it's you know all that stuff so it's a fun genre i don't know what you'd call it but it's one that i really like and i hope we see a whole lot more um, but that is 10 subgenres of sci-fi. There's a whole lot more. There's also a lot of other books that blend between genres and are hard to pin down. Um, but it's, it's great. It's cool. And I hope you all go out and read more sci-fi because it is a great genre and I love it so much. So with that said, I will let you go. I will see you next week. And in the meantime, happy reading. Bye.